Hey everybody, I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I am your basic run of the mill Protestant. And I got a buddy named Jeremy Holmes who's a basic run of the mill Catholic. And that's underselling him a little bit. He's exceptional, brilliant. He's a college professor, a theology guy, a Bible guy, and he used to be a Protestant. It's really easy to sit and talk with him, and I thought it'd be fun to share my conversations with him over a meal that we barely ever get around to eating with you over the course of several months. So this is the third video on, I don't know, Catholicism and Protestantism and what it means and what stuff we have in common and what the distinctives are between us and what it would look like to maybe get along a little better than we do sometimes on the internet. And I think it's a really fun conversation. This time around, we're picking right up where we left off last time, where I expressed optimism about the state of Christian unity and the trajectory of Christian unity in the last several years, and then I bounced it to him, and we're going to find out what he thinks about that. From there, we're going to get into some questions about whether or not the Reformation was a good idea, or if net total, more good or more bad came out of that. And then we're going to talk about the Mary thing, which I think is an oddly hot button topic between Catholics and Protestants. And well, I think the conversation is rewarding or useful, or I wouldn't be putting it on the internet for you. So let's go sit down with Jeremy Holmes and talk Protestantism and Catholicism and see where we get today. I'm Matt, this is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. Let's get after it. I think it's a testimony to the reality and truth of the gospel that you still have so many people inside the circle of historical Christianity mm -hmm. who really can't agree on that stuff you were saying at the beginning about who God is, who Jesus is, what happened on the cross, Mm -hmm. and where mm -hmm. we fit. Do you think I'm being too optimistic? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess I'd be fine being optimistic that way so long as we stay in the group of the people who are also just lamenting the the divisions that's still, that's still there, right? Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, yeah, we have the, the, the verse from Jesus um, about uh, they'll, they'll know, they'll be convinced by your unity. But, you know, from the position I'm in where I've got this preset commitment to this visible community, I also have to be in a situation of lamenting the, frag the visible fragmentation of that community, right? I can't stop that. That would be to, I can't stop lamenting that. That would be to cease to be Catholic. Yeah, but, okay. But, um, but to be able to have a robust exchange where I'm not pulling punches on my Catholicism, you're not pulling punches on your Protestantism, um, but uh, we are physically pulling punches, so to speak. We're not actually stabbing each other. We think different things, um, but we're being nice. Then, um, <laughs> yeah. And that's, you know, and that could, you say, yeah, that's, that's a very, uh, that's a good situation to be in. It's much better than uh, lots of other possible situations we could be in. I, I cannot disassociate this whole situation from the, the story of the Old Testament and the splitting of North, northern and southern Israel. Um, every time I think about the, the lack of unity among Christians, I think of that story again. Because I, I teach salvation history to undergraduates, and I do it most years. I've been doing this for a while. And every time I go through the story, I'm struck by how the Old Testament authors chew on and gnaw on that split. They can't get over it. Right? Mm. That, that the people of God split. And, you know, so then uh, it's just unthinkable. Like, how, how does this make any sense in God's plan, right? So even in the story of Joseph, you have this, um, uh, if you read it, you've got a close comparison of Joseph and Judah. Right? Like Judah's story with Tamar, where he doesn't look so great, mm -hmm. comes immediately, is, is placed chronologically out of joint in order to be right next to Joseph's story that with is Potiphar's odd, wife. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's like the, the author is saying, you see these two? Mm -hmm. One of these looks better than the other, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Um, well, it's Joseph who looks better. Joseph, who later, because his sons each become a tribe, Joseph becomes Ephraim. And the northern kingdom is Ephraim. The southern kingdom is Judah. I think that what's going on in that story is he's saying, sort of in, in seed, or at least he's thinking about the future and saying, the two kingdoms, look at that. The, the north was actually the better part. How is this going on? How are we too? Uh, and of course, the prophets are obsessed with this. I mean, a big part of their, sure. their idea of, of the, the, what the Messiah is going to do is reunite Israel and get over the schism within the people of God, right? 
Ephraim and Judah will, will be one again. Um, and as a Christian, I, just, I feel the same way about the divisions within the Christian community. Like, it's just, it, it remains a mystery. Like, how could this happen in God's plan that Christ's body, his visible body, is so rent? And there's a way in which you just can't get over that. You keep gnawing on it. And maybe one of our first questions when we you know, enter the kingdom of heaven will be, okay, so what about that? What was going on? What was the plan? Why did you even allow that? Uh, to go down. Um, you think more people or less people are Christians because the Reformation happened? Oh, gee. I do not know a way to play that forward in my head. Let me make a case for no. Okay. My case for no would be that as Protestant as I am, the language of one visible church is compelling to me. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the churches that I think are structured that way it means that they are much more at the whim of one home office or one individual leader. Mm -hmm. And I am mm -hmm. a product of the Enlightenment, and I do believe in separation of power and mm -hmm. checks mm -hmm. and balances and sure. all of that. So I, yeah. I got to take into account that I am wired to be suspicious okay. of a hierarchy like, like, like Rome historically, mm -hmm. suspicious of other religions that have that strong singular prophet or home yeah. office. But done right, done under the authority of Scripture, um, done with an eye for the gospel and done at a time where history doesn't kind of deal the church the hand of being the surrogate ruler of a bunch of kingdoms in Europe, mm -hmm. which, let's be honest, probably seemed like a blessing at the time, but that was a tough draw for, for Rome, for the Catholic Church. I mean, I, th I think it probably would have been more fun if you hadn't been dealt that hand mm -hmm. by history. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to get that right. Mm -hmm. I think the Evangelical Free Church is going to get that right. I mean, come yeah. on, nobody's yeah. going to get that right. You're swimming in dirty water, you're going to get dirty. I think there's grace for that. But despite all of those challenges, my case for no, that being you know, more people would have been Christians if there were no Reformation, mm -hmm. would be that I do think there's power in that unity. Mm -hmm. I do think that done right, a you know, benevolent dictator is the best thing you could ever have, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't mean that as a pejorative at all sure, toward sure. Catholicism, but the structure yeah. can work if the right people are there and there's great continuity, yeah. the ups and downs make it harder. Right. So all things being equal, I think there's a good case to be made for, no, it would have been better if there weren't a reformation and more people would have been Christians mm -hmm. with us moving forward as one monolithic group. And I would add to that, um, no great schism either mm -hmm. in this hypothetical. Yeah, and maybe I can sort of backfill what I take to be your intention, that is to say, um, when you say no reformation, you're including and none of the stuff that led up to the Reformation, right. none, of, none of all that occasion that caused that split, if we could just make all that better such that there is no break there. Oh, yeah. Then, well, oh, if you can take away all the yuck in the history of the yeah. church from I mean, of course, all expressions, I'm, that'd I'm, be amazing. My, you know, of course, the position that I would be committed to as a Catholic is that even with all the junk, we shouldn't have done the Reformation. But I understand your commitment would be different. So I started to see, sure. for, just for the sake of... of tracking what you're saying. You're saying, granted, it would have been better had the dumpster fire not happened so that the break didn't need to happen so that we could have kept rolling forward as one. I am hypothetically throwing out one case for no, and I'll make a case for yes in okay. a minute, that dumpster fire or no, mm -hmm. soldiering through that together, the Greeks, the people that eventually went on to become Protestants, the people who stayed put yeah. with Rome, Soldiering through that together, I can see an avenue by which mm -hmm. more people are Christians and the kingdom looks better and is in better shape that mm -hmm. route. Mm -hmm. My case for, uh, yes, I think more people are Christians because of the Great Schism and because of mm -hmm. the Protestant Reformation would be, uh, I think it's not a coincidence that the Protestant Reformation happened at about the same time as colonialism and exploration taken off. Mm -hmm. The gospel is enormously adaptable. Rome was in a place where it had very much built itself to deal with Western and Northern European concerns. Mm -hmm. And understandably, Rome was gonna be a product uh, of its time and the centuries that it preceded. I mean, they had to wield the sword and the scepter that puts them in a tough spot. Not a very flexible spot, not, not a spot that's loose and ready to change as the scientific revolution occurs and we start to think about data and knowledge and reason and logic and not so much a medieval way, but in this kind of new early enlightenment, enlightenment, scientific modern era way. 
well, here comes Protestantism. Mm -hmm. And I think some of Protestantism's insistence or optimism that it can systematize everything is misguided, and I push back on that all the time. It still seemed like a very well-built vehicle to take the gospel into an expanding world and mm -hmm. put those basic truths we'd agree on about Jesus, fallenness, salvation, all of that, mm -hmm. in front of a larger and different audience. Yeah. And I think if that Maybe you could argue that that was going to happen anyway, and that's what the Jesuits were about. And I was what, about to say Jesuit, yeah. Okay. Um, Not as an ultimate model, but just as, a, as, as an example of somebody trying to be as adaptable as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that would be my case for, for yes, I think more people are Christians as a result of this. Mm -hmm. and the gospel is diverse. It seems like certain parts of the world are wired and built, and because of their historical mm -hmm. story and their ups and downs, maybe they are more designed to hear it the way a Protestant would put it, or more designed to hear it the way a Jesuit would put it, or hear it more designed the way that, you know, they're more designed to hear it the way that just straight up Roman Rite Catholicism would put it. It's at least possible that either are true, and that what we know for sure is that we, like the gospel just didn't stop in the mid 16th century, and Christianity didn't just like break and collapse and fall apart. Mm -hmm. And understandably, mm -hmm. as the leaving party, I'm gonna feel a little bit more optimistic about the departure. Sure. And yeah. while I would, I, I, while I was nodding when you were saying the stuff about grieving it, like, yeah, I have to acknowledge that. I think it's a grief that you probably feel more acutely mm -hmm. as a Catholic than sure. I do as a Protestant. Yeah. And maybe you're right and I ought to take it more seriously. <laughs> Is it okay if I just throw out some of the questions that I know Protestants would want me to ask you Sure. Okay. We, we, let's pitch this back and forth. Yeah. Okay. What is it that Catholics really honestly believe about Mary, and and why do you believe that? Right. Well, let me just say this. I think that of the various individual topics one could choose, this one is actually more bound up with the 500 assumptions in the background uh -huh. than even than the others. The reason I say that is because um, a number of people who were Protestant and then became Catholic have shared with me that um, Mary was the last thing they got comfortable with, right? Hmm. That maybe they, 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 they've come to con be convinced that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, and then they, they've got this irresistible draw, they find themselves Catholic, but there's, they're Catholic still squirming about Mary, and then it's only once they're inside the Catholic faith and start acquiring sort of that, the total mindset that one day she snaps into place for them, um, but I've never talked to anyone who says, I became convinced the church was right about Mary, and that just pulled me in. Huh. Right? It's, yeah. Um, okay. So I think in fairness, uh, uh, if, if, if people feel a disconnect, um, that may be just a thing. Um, so, yeah, what is going on with the Mary thing? Um, several layers at once, one of which you've already hit on, just the, the, the she is the single most interesting female character in the Bible. Um, I think that um, you know the the earlier Christians were happy to refer to her as the mother of God, and Protestants need to be happy with that too. But I really think that another layer goes back to this, what I keep referring to as a, this this fundamental divide between the way Protestants are thinking and the way Catholics are thinking. That is, a Catholic is thinking of Christ founding a, an individual, visible community, and in the Catholic mind, that's kind of what the incarnation is about. Just like Christ has an individual body and you can poke it, he has this church that's individual and you can go poke it. Once you're in that mindset, then you're gonna read some things differently, um, right? And again, I'm not arguing for, I'm not presenting the case for the mindset here, I'm just saying no, once sure, you're there, yeah. right. then you say you, you get into the book of Revelation and you see that the New Jerusalem ha is, uh, has 12 foundations and the, the foundations have the names of the apostles on them, right? You see, oh, the whole church is founded on these individual dudes. Hmm. Um, there's an actual concrete structure to the church, and they have their place in the structure. So it's, the church is not a, the New Jerusalem is not a, a free-floating like a gas of Christians. It's a, it's a building with every brick in its individual spot as God hmm. has, has ordained it, and the apostles have their spot. Once you're in that mentality, um, then it makes sense. Let me just put it as, as, as something that you could see as reasonable, that 
you, you begin to see the mother of God as having a concrete place in that totality. And you ask, then what's her role? What does she do? Um, at which point, I think you're just into a zone of questions that many Christians aren't asking themselves because they don't share the mentality that would lead to the questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then you say, well, um, let me scan for evidence about what, what her role is. This is where you get into um, uh, so the, the presentation of Mary sort of in terms of the new Eve. Right, which is a, a, a naming, that's a way of naming her role as Christ is, the, is, is Adam. And just as it was really Adam who took us down, you know, Paul refers to, to Adam's sin, but he had an accomplice, right? So Christ is the new Adam. He's the one who saves us. Um, but he's got this, this person with him, the, um, Mary, uh, who like at the wedding of Cana, seems to play a kind of adjunct role. She doesn't, she can't work miracles. She's not God. but but she has this role in, in prompting him to do the miracle. And yet, um, and yet later on, she and the rest of Jesus' family, which the Protestants would be like brothers right. and sisters and family, right. I think you guys frame that a little differently. It looks like she doesn't get what he's doing when he's teaching, and it looks like she wants to come and die. She didn't go in to hear his sermon. Mm -hmm. She's standing outside, and it mm -hmm. looks like they're here to collect Jesus to stop him from whatever he's doing here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Jesus doesn't roll along with it. Mm -hmm. So, so you kind of got those two places where Mary really crops back up, and I almost feel like what I'm saying is in support of the Catholic position here, because if, if she's the new Eve, well, what role did Eve play? A very important one in the whole gigantic story on the positive side, mm -hmm. and also one that involved just a bit of bumbling, you know, but, but, I, but there's not room for the bumbling mm -hmm. in Catholic theology with Mary, right? Right, right. right. Yeah. And I think that's one of the places where, where, again, those 500 assumptions for Protestants, we just look at that and go, why? Why is it a problem that she was just normal? And, and again, there's an odd thing about, about, about the conversation that we have to have, right? This is the way we have to have the conversation. But um, uh, in the Catholic mind, it's just it's sort of what you've always thought. And then one day somebody asks you, why is that true? And you say, oh, there must be reasons why it's true, right? So it's not as though... Um, the, 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 the presentation of the rationale behind this would be the presentation of um, how people came to think it necessarily, historically. Mm -hmm. um, it may not have been an argumentative process, um, but I mean, you say, well, okay, is the, but is there ra a rational structure to these beliefs? I think so, you, because it comes back to the idea of does Mary occupy a definite spot? Does she have a, a hmm. particular mm -hmm. role? So what does the role require? And that gives you leverage to try and answer different questions. And so you could say, and so you could you could ask, for example, is that role compatible with her sinning, or is it just incompatible? And there, at least you have a, you at least have some ground to stand on to start talking about the question. Um, and you know, again, I said I, I can understand that if you don't have a certain conception of her role, then maybe even the question of whether she's sinning is not an important one to you? Like, why would I ask that question? Yeah, yeah, I, I um, think it's very intuitive on your but, part. Yeah. But once she has the role, then it does become a question like, okay, what, wait, was the, is, it, is that compatible? Um, and see, for me, even as I do the and what doesn't and, and fit. try to grab the opposite 500 assumptions, I, for me, it gets far more interesting and seems far more consistent with the text and with what we see in the other disciples that yeah, she was an object of redemption too. Mm -hmm. like absolutely, sure. flawed, sinful, in need of redemption, and like first in line to receive it and get it and to be intimately close with this thing. Wow, mm -hmm. blessed above all women. That's really, that's really remarkable. She was uniquely positioned among women. But for my 500 Protestant assumptions, her being sinless or a perpetual virgin right. or right. the assumption right. of Mary, and none of that is in any way necessary mm -hmm. to satisfy even what you're describing in terms of her as being a unique, uh, we're not using the word pillar, but holding this unique position. Yeah. And I think a lot of Catholics would listen to what people like me think and they'd be like, you don't value her. I'd be like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Like she is the best, mm -hmm. just the best. And she's kind of like Abram to me. Mm -hmm. What did Abram do to be picked by God? Nothing. Mm -hmm. is milling around in Ur one day and God was like, yeah, you. This is all going to start with you. Oh, here's a bunch of promises. This is what you get. Mm -hmm. well, what mm -hmm. did I do? Nothing. Right. Right. You were standing there. Right. What did Mary do? 
nothing. Mm -hmm. She's just standing there. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. of a sudden, you know, she's she's going to give birth to the redeemer of the world. And I have to think, based on my reading of, of Luke, mm -hmm. that she was more ready for it. I mean, God could have picked somebody who couldn't have hacked that. Mm -hmm. And her response is unbelievable. May it be to me as you have said. Right. I mean, are you right. kidding me? Yeah. I mean, I, I've gone to seminary. I'm a you know, longtime pastor. I, I'm not yeah, some 15-year-old girl, and I don't say that. If you, I in in case you don't catch it, she's that. like paired with Zechariah, who is not, has almost the same yes. conversation and blows it. You're right. That's so another one of these. You see these two things? One of these looks better, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> he should yeah. get it. And yeah. Yeah, 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 it's remarkable. And so it's another one of those places where even 500 assumptions aside, yeah. outside looking in with my assumptions, what has happened to Mary over 2,000 years in the Catholic tradition and in a little different way in the Orthodox tradition reminds me of what happened to Caesar in his last two or three years. Mm -hmm. Everybody got Caesar fever. Mm -hmm. It was an enormously mm -hmm. popular, safe, good for the brand thing to be like, Caesar is also Pontifex Maximus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, Caesar now gets to wear purple, but only when he's here. We also now ascribe to Caesar this title and this wealth and this thing, because mm -hmm. it was just mm -hmm. very, very safe to heap these crowns upon Caesar. Mm -hmm. And there's no, I'm not trying to hint that there's like some Ides of March 44 BC ending for Mary here. Okay, okay, the analogy yeah. breaks down at that yeah. point. But yeah. I know what it looks like to see historical examples mm -hmm. of enthusiasm just snowballing into more enthusiasm for a mm -hmm. particular character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I look at, at most of the theology surrounding Mary and it all seems like it's very late to the game. You know, and relatively speaking, it's in the last 10 to 15% of the history of the church mm -hmm. that we see, you know, these teachings about Mary really becoming yeah. officialized, to yeah. use the generic Protestant term. Okay. And I, and I guess from the outside looking in, I kind of scratch my head and I'm like, well, well, why? I mean, if that mm -hmm. was always true, why are we just getting to that now? Mm -hmm. And and where does it end? Is there anything we haven't ascribed to Mary? Because it feels like if we ascribe anything else to her, she's deity. But I know mm -hmm. you don't think she's deity. Right. Right. But but like I don't I don't know what else we could put on her. Or I'm I'm sorry, that makes it sound like I'm right. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else could be said. I don't about mind her. your thinking you're right, by the okay. way. <laughs> that's, that's totally fine. Well, sometimes when you think you're right about everything, it's real hard to learn, and I really do want to learn. So why all of this stuff so late to the game? Can anything else be ascribed to her without, without it jumping into idolatry? First off, let me just say, the, the, the calling Mary the new Eve and describing her as having a role in man's salvation is way early. I mean, you've, you've, I'm sure you've read these texts, um, but um, this is like 200s uh, within the you know, third century stuff. Um, now, so... Um, and Protestants would say New Eve? Okay. Yeah. Roman and, salvation? Mm, well, they were working out theology in those first few hundred mm -hmm. years, and that was part of working it out. So I mean, I'm going to do a couple of steps here. One is just to glance briefly at the New Testament, at least to, to claim some, um, some sympathy for the, uh, the way that a Catholic would roll with what the early fathers are doing with the New Eve. Um, that is, um, for example, in the Gospel of John, um, G, there are two, these two char wonderful characters that Jesus ne that the, the evangelist doesn't name and Jesus never addresses by name, right? First, there's the disciple whom Jesus loves. Right. John. We think it's right. John. Yeah. yeah so, uh, and, and, and the disciple whom Jesus loves has this sort of symbolic role, and he, he's next to Peter, and he's always outdoing Peter. You know, they're, 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 there's all these comparisons. Like, they, they get to the gate. Peter can't get in, but the disciple whom Jesus loved, he knows a guy. And then they, they get in, you know. Jesus rises. They run to the tomb. The disciple whom Jesus loves gets there first. He's young and but fair. then he's nice, and he waits for Peter. Um, and, and so there's this, you know, it, it, there's this role that, that the disciple whom Jesus loves pl can play because he's, he's, he's not so particularized. He's, he's got this, this symbolic name. Mary is just referred to as um, the mother of Jesus, or Jesus refers to her as woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, okay. And um, so it's like, oh, is she a symbol too? Is, does she, is she inhabiting some role in this gospel? Then you get to the, the scene of the cross, and those two characters are there. The disciple whom Jesus loved, who apparently has this name so I can maybe identify with him, maybe Jesus, I, maybe Jesus loves me. And then at the scene of the cross, there's the mother of Jesus, and he says to her, woman, you know, not, you know, not mother, not, not married, and just woman. 
behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Now, you have to appreciate, from a, coming from a Catholic world, you just, that scene is reverberating with meaning. Like, in other words, we just had the mother of God symbolically given over to each disciple, and I've been placed in a relationship with her, um, not just as some individual in Galilee, but as somebody who inhabits the role of woman, which, uh, again, I wanna, I'm just calling for sympathy here more than, more than making an argument, would roll with the idea that she's Eve. He's Adam, she's Eve. Each of us now has a personal relationship with the new Eve. Hmm. Um, or you roll into a chapter like Revelation 12, um, and of course, um, you've got the, 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 the woman who's giving birth to a son, and there's the dragon. Well, the dragon, he's Satan, he's named. The, the child, we already all know who that is. That's Jesus. And in a Catholic mind, you're like, oh, and I know who the woman is. That's Mary. And she's given wings and taken away to some place where she can be protected. You go, whoa, wow, what is this I talking mean, about? I've just never thought of connecting it that way. And that doesn't mean I think you're crazy. It just means I've just never thought of connecting it that way. And I guess what I'm saying is that the, the, without pr trying to present a case for that reading of that passage, just to say, once you come in with the, the mentality that a Catholic is bringing to it, dots are connecting that wouldn't be connecting otherwise. Mm -mm. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but, but then your question is totally fair. Um, why then did we not have like everything we now say about Mary from day one, right? Why, mm -hmm. why the big deal over time? Because you're absolutely right that there was a, um, I don't know, um, I, I don't want to sound irreverent here, but there was a, like a popularity fad that eventually took off, right? That, that, like, That's it, how it, it feels really, from the outside looking um, in. And, um, and there, I guess I would want to make a distinction between, um, yeah, belief and enthusiasm about the belief, right? That is, I think we've all had the experience of knowing something for a long time and then one day having it hit us. Okay, sure. Right? Yeah. And you could say, something held back this thing people thought about Mary actually hitting them with full force for a while. And I, to be honest, I think some of it was just lack of clarity about other things like Jesus, right? That is, until the whole Nestorian thing goes down and we have 100% clarity that um, he, you cannot heap enough honors and graces and so on on Jesus to make him a savior unless you say God, right. in which case, boom, you just went to infinity there, right? Yeah. There's, there, there, that, you can't keep increasing his grace until the point where it's equal to calling him God. Um, Nestorius wanted to, you know, was, was a, a very devout man in a lot of ways, just, you know, thought the world of this man, Jesus, right? Um, was willing to heap all kinds of stuff on him. And, um, and the church eventually said, yeah, but none of that even comes close to calling him mm -hmm. God. Well, once Jesus is off to infinity, um, then maybe it feels safer to say, oh, then nothing stops us from following instincts about Mary because there, there won't be a point where we keep adding compliment to compliment where she's suddenly God or even rivaling God or even a savior or something like that, right? We, we settled that with the Nestorian controversy. So there's almost like, again, I don't wanna sound irreverent, there's a vacancy, right? Where we're sort of in the Nestorian zone where you can say, what about a super duper hyper graced person who's just beyond what you've ever thought about in terms of all the gifts God has heaped upon her? Uh, and as a Catholic, you'd say, yeah, still infinitely far from Jesus and safe forever. We can keep talking. Um, and then once you're in that zone where you say, okay, then it's, um, well, okay, I, there's that. And then I think there's also a medieval chivalric tradition that kicks in. Right, okay. where, where there's, a, there's a, the role of the lady. Mm -hmm. right? I think so too. Uh, and then and I think a second level of that kicks in when you get into uh, views of women, particularly in Latin American colonization. And I think there's just a certain meshing that really makes sense there mm -hmm. with um, a version of Mary that might not be intuitive to an outsider from a different part of the world in a different mm -hmm. time. But yeah, I would view those as the two big bumps so, as well. So there, I guess, I have to say is, um, having made the distinction between what you think and how it's hitting you and whether it's hitting you, you say, okay, so there's a point where it hits people. 
And then that's going to be the point where they actually start to chew over and think more deeply about what they've always thought and perhaps tease out a few more implications, which would be, as a Catholic, how I see the, the sort of further doctrinal statements that come down the road um, as being um, all things that either have always been held but never articulated or that were always implied but not said so clearly because Mary just wasn't on the brain quite the same way. Um, and I think I would leave room for, um, for something like, you know, that chivalric tradition with the lady of the castle and the kind of distant chaste love that the young knight has for the unapproachable late, and to the way in which that all colors how, pe how boots on the ground devotion played out. Um, that may, that may be of more or less value. You know, you, your mileage may vary on that. I mean, with you and me today in America and Wyoming, um, some of that stuff doesn't stir the way it would have uh, in another setting. Right. Um, but it would have value to the degree that it's a kind of um, in the trenches attempt to say and, and pay respect to Mary's particular role in the body of Christ and say maybe in a different cultural situation we would have used a different set of lenses to say that but if that's what we're saying go okay good i can you know i can i can roll with that well enough i want to invite you to come back for the next part of this conversation because the question about mary and her unique role in the minds of catholics versus mary and her being awesome but maybe not occupying quite as unique a role in the mind of protestants is one that can't really be discussed properly without getting into the question of the Catholic versus Protestant understanding of Christians who have come before us or saints as they get called in general. So we're going to get into how that evolved, what we make of it, what does the saint thing look like within Catholicism today, how do Protestants view these really cool people who came before, and what might be the assumptions behind the misunderstandings or even points of well-understood disagreement between the two parties. So that's next up. Thank you to my friend Jeremy for being awesome and gracious and also honest and telling me what he actually thinks. Thank you to you for being up for a conversation like this. Thank you also to all of those of you who set a great pace and a great tone in the comment section, I really would like for this to be fruitful and to make things better at a time in human history where we seem to be in the mood to burn things down. I really like tracking down people on the internet, people in real life who are interested in trying to understand each other better and see what points of commonality we can find figure out where we need to maybe agree to disagree and maybe figure out where we just misunderstood each other and actually agree and get along better than we even thought. So thank you for helping to set that pace and that tone. I've really enjoyed connecting with you as well because of that. All right, I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. More of this coming soon.